Stunning. Thank you. What an eclectic mix of stuff you get up to. <laughs> Do you want to roll us into the session, Jonathan? Okay. So, um, my, my, this is kind of loose and open. I can't say I have prepared. I certainly don't have any slides or anything like that. Um, the invitation was to see what kind of resources that I have up on my website is kind of like a, a hodgepodge library and collection of things just to make it easy to refer people to stuff. Um, and I see a couple of you have questions that I will address at some point and uh, Julia has lots of questions too. But what I thought would be best is I'll just say a few general things about how I approach um, integrating adult development with coaching and maybe a little bit about a couple of projects we've done this on, ways we've done it. And then um, I would like to have you guys go in breakouts for a little bit and just kind of come up with some questions because that, it's much more interesting for me to hear what you're thinking about and to start working with that. But I'll provide a little bit of something up front here. Um, so I came across adult development in the mid 90s. Actually, Brian Hall's work was the first thing I came across, then um, Robert Keegan, and then through Ken Wilbur, Bill Torbert, and other people. Um, met Suzanne 20 years ago, spent a week at her house in 2004. Um, and and I, I feel very, how I say, grateful to have been able to be between where I lived in British Columbia, not so much, but I spent a lot of time in the San Francisco Bay Area, being able to kind of hang out and network with a lot of that community um, early on in my learning to understand this. So more than just reading things people wrote, I got to talk with them, be in discussion groups with them. Um, and that was very helpful to kind of flesh out the kind of theory and see how does how do they enact these kind of things in practice? Um, I got into coaching. So I would say this, I have no formal coaching training. I have not done inter, what is it? ICF or CTI or any of these kind of things. But I seem to be one of these people who reads books about stuff and then just goes out and tries it and does it. And, and my students seem happy and they seem to be effective as coaches. So seems to be working okay. If I was to say, how do I introduce this to people who really don't have any background in it? I will often talk about development in terms of simply recognizing that we all went from where the world was all about us when we're 8, 10, 12 years old. And I have some good stories about that that are highly embarrassing, that always help the students kind of connect with their own experiences. And at some point, we bump up against the world in a way where we realize that just being in our own world isn't going to get us friends, isn't going to influence people, isn't, we're not going to get along. And so we start to learn how to shape our identity around our peers, be in, taking in more influence from our mentors, role models, teachers, parents, whoever. And we internalize that. And, and if we're good, we kind of learn how to be good people in the world in whatever form we do that. And at some point, as we kind of add more to that, we can also hit the limits of this, that somehow somewhere in our career, people are expecting something more of us and we don't quite get what that more is. And this is, you know, Keegan's title of his book, In Over Our Heads. You know, we find ourselves somehow not getting an implicit expectation or demand of the world, whether it's in our jobs, in our relationships, um, all those kind of domains. And so when I introduce kind of that broad framing and say that coaching is often about 
helping people understand where they're at on this lifelong journey and what they can do to start to kind of bootstrap or scaffold their way to a slightly more expansive and comprehensive way of making sense of themselves and the world around them, their relationships, the systems they're in. And that's the kind of very broad sense of that. Um, I also work with tools and models that are more specific to um, cognitive complexity. What are the underlying structures of how we think, not just make meaning, but how, what tools do we think? And a simple way of talking about that is most of us grow up and grow into the ability to make logical reasoning and think, well, A causes B, you know, this happened and what's the cause? And some of us get to the point where we recognize that it's not as simple as that that there are multiple things that are influencing any given event and that there are different relationships between those things that are actually more impactful than the people or the things themselves. And we start to see simple systems and we're able to kind of look at those and we eventually expand our context out to see more complex systems, larger senses of community, and when we can do that, we can more easily mentor and help others to see a little bit more than they can. And so that's how I look at coaching is, and there's many kind of tools and techniques and methods, and we'll talk about some of those and you guys will ask questions and so on. But I would say that's all I want to say for the moment, and if Simon, you'd be so kind as to put people in groups of three or so and just let them chat and mingle for five, seven minutes, something like that, and come up with questions that you'd like to ask or perspectives that you're curious about, and then bring those into the chat when you come back. And then we'll kind of go through a list of topics and invite some discussion. Beautiful, fabulous. Um, Andrea, are you on the breakout room scene? Fantastic. So um, we're going to give you, what time is it now? Almost 20 past. So so it's sort of 27 minutes past then, Jonathan, if we could be generous and give people about eight minutes to chat. And so you'll get a one minute warning or so. Um, go off, have fun. Yeah. Mingle and chat. And we'll see you again. And off they go. Little by little. Jonathan, I, you went automatically to your room, but just stay here. I'll move you. Yeah, no, no, I, I know how to not join now. And uh, <laughs> I'm very Sorry, familiar with being here in Zoom. You just knew. Just Elizabeth and Alida. I'm just gonna move. Um... Yeah, sometimes you gotta move people around and. I'll move out of the room. Is it okay if one person has uh, four? Yeah, yeah, that's, that doesn't. No, that's, all good. Three? that's fine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No totally okay, so I'll 20, room, maybe. 427. Alida's still there. Where? Where do you see a leader? Oh, not her. in the main room. Yeah. Sometimes people are online and then have to go away for a minute or don't always see the breakout invite. No, Alida, I actually know she finishes work just when we start supervision. And so she's usually driving, but she loves ah. part of it. So I know it pretty well. That's okay. So we can, can we force her into a room? No. I put oh, there she went. Yeah. Brilliant. Do you. I love that. Um, I love that conceptualization of of maturation. Oh, of good development. Yeah, it really makes it very practical. It's it's sometimes quite challenging to land it with some of our corporate clients. Yeah, uh, find the languaging, particularly yeah. at the earlier levels of development, of course. And, and you know, so I, I use maybe I'll grab that off the shelf too, and I should take a quick bio break before we come back. Yeah, sure. Um, so I use this book, 
Um, and it's, it's really helpful because when I used to use either Torbert's book or Joyner and Joseph's book, people were more kind of reactive and arguing. And when I use this, nobody, it's just like, oh, they get it right away. Uh, arguing about what? Oh, about development in general. Okay. About the whole concept about, oh, you know, Scandinavia is a very flat, you know, yeah. so this idea of differences is already kind of, uh, you know, scary and... Yeah. But I have almost no resistance when people read this to the whole concept. Oh, amazing. Because some of the, the hierarchical natures of the model or the nature of the model also can get people's backs up in corporates. Oh, yeah. Well, we, tend, we tend to leave that out of workshops in terms of individual <laughs> levels of development. Um, yeah. And kind of more of the collective. Yeah. So I'll be back in just a moment. Yeah, cool. Okay. What book did he share? I had the, the chat the room box up. Uh, the author was Eigel, E-I-G-E-L, and it was called The Map. Say, spell the author's name again, E? E-I-G-E-L. -E oh, okay, The Map, thanks. Um, I'm just eating a, some food. Should I be um, pausing recording or I just leave it rolling and Marlon will edit it? Oh, yes, um, rather pause it. Just rang. There we go. Okay. Are they on the countdown? Yep, yeah, there we go. Okay, okay. good. Awesome. Perfect. With all the integrations, that, oh, the recording again. That's okay. No, I was just saying, it's like the thing with WhatsApp where you have it for work and then you want it to be off. Julia always deals with it and then it still is on while you're on this. <laughs> and it seems like I didn't switch it off, but I want you to know that I thought I did. People phone you. I've had <laughs> Skype plings come up during presentations to clients, you know, it's like, hmm, not good. <laughs> like the integration is helpful to a point, and then it's like, how does one yeah. switch off? Disintegrate. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> it's easy. And it's bloody hard as well, because once they've got you, they've got you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but then you want it, you want the WhatsApp to call you back because then it's helpful, you know, <laughs> and your screen. Um, yes, Eastern Cape was back first. Wow. Yeah, yeah we super quick. I'm the only one away from this bus. Speedy Gonzalez. Here. I'm not surprised you've all been up since five. Yeah, I've seen that pack occasionally that sort of I've had and reaches for a sweet, but I think she's actually asleep. Julia, do you have pink hair? I do, only Very marginally, cool. only slightly. Very and my cool. patty does as well, except for the <laughs> nice finger. The old people on this trip, but no, I'm just talking to them. The old people have got pink hair, yeah. <laughs> cool, welcome back. So, um, no. what, what would be helpful for me right now then is if, from whatever you're discussing or whatever's on your mind now and you didn't get to discuss whatever, if you could just make a little note of that in the chat. And then, then I'll invite people to speak to some of those. There's a couple of questions that came in advance that I'll make sure we talk to as well. But uh, for me, I much like to hear from you guys and what you're thinking about, what you're curious about. And it's for me, it's nice if it, there's a list in the chat just because that uh, lets me get an uh, overview of the, the group as a whole.
Oh, there we got a good one coming in already. Oh, okay. Yeah. Oh, good. I like well informed questions. <laughs> Maybe they have been reading your stuff and on your website. <laughs> well, then we'd probably suffer from more geeky questions, more technically nuanced ones, right? More general ones are actually more open and better. I'll give people another minute or so just to uh, put something in there and then we can start in. I just enjoy the silence too. Yeah, I was going to threaten to put some more eighties music on to hurry people up. <laughs> the Bon Jovi or some White Snake or something just to get the action rolling. No, I, I see. I don't know. I have all these cultural references, but if I uh, want to have a countdown, oh. hopefully you'll be able to hear this. Found that on YouTube as well. So, does that mean they're out of time then? Yeah, that means I'll start talking now, and you can continue to add things. Oh, what does more to this mean versus coach versus client? Oh, okay. Yeah, maybe I'll start there. Hmm. So, so actually, what I'm curious about, Martha, Mar Margretha, is can you say more about what? What does more than this mean to coach versus client? So that's a very interesting question. Now I got to find where you are on here to see. Ah, there you are. Could you just say a little bit more about that? Yeah, I, I think it is. It, it was I actually tapped on behalf of the group. So um, um, I would like to invite my group members to also pitch in um, and elaborate elaborate more. Um, Nicola, as well as 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 Tessa, um, but um, it, it's it's really to to say. Um, so, uh, if the coach look at it and it looks at what what is more than this versus what the client sees it as more than this, with well, which one do you work? Um, you know, so uh -huh. so which perspective do you then focus right. on? Yeah, no, that, that's helpful. That clarifies. So, and this, I was just thinking about this in relation to a conversation some colleagues and I were having in relation to one of our clients. And that we see that it's easy for us to see all sorts of possibilities and needs and more than this that they could do as an organization. But for the client, for the person that you know we're kind of mainly working with who's a leadership development specialist we need to stay a little closer to what he sees as a little bit more than this because our experience has been if we rush in with our enthusiasm about everything we see that's possible it's a bit overwhelming and off-putting mm -hmm. or can make people feel small or stupid even or you know so trying to stay close to what it means for the client is, is really important. What's important for you as a coach, I think, in relation to that, and this brings up a whole host of issues around ethics in relation to development and coaching, is what if the client is more complex than you are? Mm. How, how do you actually uh, stretch them if you can't think beyond? So generally it's said that you know you should be kind of half a level to a level beyond so that you understand the territory the person's heading into more intimately because it's closer mm -hmm. to you mm -hmm. if, if you're in a position where they're half a step ahead of you they're often going to find the formulations or things you direct their attention to 
as, yeah, I've already been there and done that, or no, I don't mean that, I mean this. And then they're continually trying to scaffold you. Yeah, absolutely. Cool, comfortable with that, thank you. Jonathan, what would you do in that kind of situation? I mean, I'm sure there's no hard and fast rule, but um, the, I guess there are options there that is the, open to the coach. The general rule is to say, you know, maybe there's somebody else that might be a better fit for you. Yeah. And then, and this is where it's helpful to work in a network where you have some understanding of where people are on this spectrum or continuum. And if you understand where the client is in some way, and that's where assessments help a lot, then you can kind of calibrate that more effectively. Mm. But in terms of how to talk to the client, it's often, well, you know, I, I feel like I'm struggling or I'm not hitting the mark here. Maybe a colleague of mine and I can recommend some names might be a better fit. Mm. Without activating fear of rejection in the client, I suppose. It's to be quite skillfully done. Well, and, and it's, it's also just, sometimes it's just chemistry. Sometimes it's just person, you know, there's many kinds of things that can be part of it, but we understand that developmental differences can make a big difference mm. that is often masked or hidden by other ways that people cope with those differences. Mm. Some people cope with a developmental stretch with eagerness and curiosity and others with kind of defensiveness and entrenchment. Um, so I then go back through the list here and just start working my way a little bit. So how to sense which colliding perspective or heat experience will open things up rather than shut things down. Oh, Kate, what, do, what more can you say about that? I, I have ideas, but I'd like to hear more from you first. Well, um, I'm, I'm working with a specific team, a senior leadership team, uh, a lot of fives and sevens, very not keen on what they perceive to be negative emotions. Um, so very, very positive or avoiding of emotion. And, and, and yet that is, they're at, they're at uh, their center of gravity is at performing but needing to consolidate more at performing. So emotional intelligence being a key mm -hmm. entry point to that. Um, and I just, as it happened, you know, as it happens in the last day, I've listened to um, Tammy Simon's latest podcast with Carla McLaren on emotions in the workplace. Okay. And as I'm listening to it, I guess I'm thinking, sure, they're going to think that I'm very Enneagram 4 because I'm Enneagram 4. Are they going to think I'm very weird and this is going to actually shut down the conversation? Uh, or is it or is it going to open up the conversation so that they can start seeing the value of emotions at work of these other perceived negative ones? So that's, that's the immediate conversation context that I'm sort of I'm sort of yeah trying to sense into like is this going to open things up or is it actually going to not be helpful so that's where it, that's the context that it's coming from that question yeah. well that's great I'll add a little bit of how I interpreted it myself and then try to respond more to that more contextually rich uh, framing so I think of this in relation to Ronald Heifetz's notion of how do you kind of regulate conflict almost? How do you keep people in a productive zone of disequilibrium? So that there's enough pain and discomfort that they're willing to learn, but not so much that they kind of, you know, do the usual shoot the messenger, you know, treat it as a technical problem, all those kind of things. And that's, that's part of what I'm thinking about. And then it's often just a sensitivity in the room in the moment in terms of, how are people responding to the existing kind of pressures or tensions that they're experiencing? Can do you need to kind of do something to back off and slow things down? Or is it getting too low of a pain point so they're not actually engaging and they need to feel the heat more? In relation to the framing you gave around the Enneagram types, I think that those differences when people aren't as explicitly conscious of the different types, they will be more embedded within their type is the way to see the world and everybody else is just weird. And how to frame that to enable them to 
um, be a little more open to other perspectives or styles. And then in relation to emotion specifically, I think, you know, Brenny Brown's work is very good about this, about helping people understand that vulnerability isn't a weakness, it's actually a strength. But how do you create enough psychological safety to get people to take that risk and get the first person to kind of do that? And I think about that in terms of self-disclosure often helps. Just saying, you know, here's how I'm feeling about this. Here's what I'm concerned about. How many, who else is feeling that way? Or who else might feel differently? Um, I was just thinking, you know, I've been reading a lot and hanging out with some of the clean language people. I don't know if you guys are familiar with them, but, um, you know, the simple question and, and for who is it different? You know, it is a simple way to open up that it's okay to have this experience, but it's okay to have a different one too. Um, and the last thing that came to my mind is just how can you show them that emotions are present and are influencing what's going on in a group dynamic, especially that there are biases and hidden judgments based on emotional responses that are leaking into things, but they just don't have a way of talking about it. So I don't know if that helps, but um, I see your head nodding, so that sounds like a good yes, thing. Yes, absolutely. Lots of lots of things to work with there. Thanks, Jonathan. Um, so Claire asked about intrigued by the idea of adult development. Isn't it just leadership development? What is the adultness about? Oh, can you say more about that, Claire? Well, I mean, we were interested in, you know, when we typically talk about development, it's usually along a particular spectrum. So um, leadership development, spiritual development, cognitive development. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, and I'm, I'm comparing it because I have two small children. So I think a lot about children's development and that's pretty clear. You start one place and you're supposed to go through these stages and you get to another place. So is there something that adults should be doing in the same way that children should be doing? And what is the relationship of that with regard to, to leadership and, and other, other kind of trajectories of development? I think that that was the question, yeah. yeah. Oh, brilliant question. Um, there are lots of different angles that I think about around that. Um, and, and partly because I'm trying to build some online kind of modules for building skills for people based on these principles. And one of the things that I, and actually it's the next thing I'm supposed to write is some little blurb about how it's easy for us to see development in kids around concrete sensory motor skills. You know, when our children learn to walk, it's very visible, it's very tangible. When they learn how to do arithmetic, it's, it's very easy to see. As you go through um, into later stages of development, you move into more abstract kind of things. So I like to think of it as thinking tools. And maybe I'll give you a, a slight uh, different angle, maybe Kurt Fisher's work. Kurt Fisher took um, Piaget's notion of development, you know, epistemology and co cognitive development and linked it with behaviorism the notice of how does the environment influence our performance? And said that, okay, so kids will develop these sensory motor skills and then they'll develop more complex ones. They'll be able to link skills to each other and so on. And then the, the story that somebody gave that I think is a good example. So as a little kid, they learn to brush their teeth. And at first they smear the toothpaste all over and eventually they learn how to keep it on their teeth and, and they build sensory motor skills for doing a very specific thing. And then they build sensory motor skills for putting their pajamas on. And at first the tops go on the head and you know things are backwards or inside out, but eventually they build the sensory motor skills for doing that. And then they learn how to crawl into bed and tuck themselves in. All of these are complex systems of sensory motor skills. 
but they might at some point become aware that in the background, when all this is going on, they hear their parents using the word bedtime. It's bedtime. Now you have to brush your teeth and put your pajamas on and crawl into bed. And the cognitive kind of bandwidth, once they kind of internalize in, in Kahneman system one, it becomes automatic and habitual to do these sensory motor things. They can start to notice cognitively there's an abstract representation in one word that means I do all these things. And that frees up attentional space and cognitive you know, freedom to not have to think so explicitly about all those concrete things. Now, these representations are big breakthroughs in how language helps you kind of chunk things. And then you can put two of these together and then you can put a bunch of them together and make a complex system of representations. And eventually you can get to, and I'll, I'll find my way to bringing up a slide in a few minutes. You find your way up to abstractions, abstract thinking. And in that, you see that concepts like truth or fairness or justice or things that become single entities. Um, I'm going to, something you'll need to enable me to share the screen at some point here, Simon. Um, yeah. I think this will actually be the right thing. I've got, yeah. Um, and uh, this is a long winded way of answering your question, but we'll get there. Um, so these abstract concepts then start to be linked. Oh, somebody is a good a friend if they're loyal or somebody is truthful if they're honest. Uh, you know, and that, that is this kind of level where people can cognitively do kind of formal logic. They do if then thinking, all these kind of things. And then eventually some people, not, not the whole population by any means, can start to take multiple abstractions and weave them together in a system. So let's see, if, yeah, Simon has been nice here. And I'll just show you very quickly here. This is um, coming from a developmental tool by Lectica. There's tons of, I think they have like 50,000 empirical performances in their database. They have a million items in the dictionary and they, they're using this to score things. But the word truth in itself is a very kind of simple concept that enters in. So the levels seven, eight, nine, ten 10 come from Fisher's skill theory and I can send references to that. A, B, C and D are quarter of a level within each or quarter of a phase within each level. So you see the term truth evolves then it's not the truth, that's a little more complex. Then really the truth is actually in a different level than just the term truth. But then you can see truth when, or truth even or unless, or a kind of truth. And then the, the more abstract concept of being truthful is a, an abstraction. That's what starts single abstractions at level nine. And then you find the truth, the whole truth, be truthfully, and then the notions of ugly truth or a grain of truth are something that comes about where you can link concepts. Now, back to your question. This is a, I, I'm good at doing these long-winded um, things. It is more challenging to talk about this as adults because the things we're talking about are thinking skills. They're not sensory motor skills, they're thinking tools. There is a knowledge economy and we use thinking tools to do our work. And those tools become more and more subtle, more nuanced and less concretely visible. So the challenge for adult development as a field as a whole because this applies to us in our relationships, in all sorts of things, 
is how do we learn to address the complexity of a given situation we're in to, to get our heads around the whole set of complex considerations that might be influencing that moment rather than filtering out half of them because we can only look at one or two things because that's all we have the cognitive maturity to do. So I, I'd be curious to what you think about that long-winded answer. No, I find that very helpful. In fact, I think what, what's interesting is the way and possibly the challenge is the extent to which this developmental trajectory we're on as adults, because it's invisible, is not recognized um, necessarily. And so, whereas children's development is obvious, in adults, it's not obvious, and therefore it's not necessarily recognized. And it's, it's you know, within an organization, for example, it's not, um, it's not like you can, <laughs> it's not like you say, okay, right, you, you know, you can read, right, you've got your matrix, so now you, you know, there, there's a kind of, the, the, the there's this kind of in, invisible developmental um, scale that, you know, for those of us who, who work with these things, part of what we need to do is, is make visible this, this developmental trajectory yeah. for the organizations we work in and, and, and the people yeah. that we work with. Um, so, yeah, and, and that, uh, yeah, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. Thank you very much. Well, and, and part of that thing of making it visible. So when I work with uh, the developmental assessments I use, we'll get feedback in the assessment that says, okay, this is how you tend to be thinking about these issues now. And we'll get things that will give us clues about what would be a quarter of a level different. What are certain terms? And then we'll ask people to think about that and think, well, what would it be like to take actions with that in mind? Or have you thought about, yeah. And we often get this, it's like, yeah, I recognize that. It's kind of off here, but I, but I see I don't actually do it. So what would it take to do that instead of what it is you're doing? And, and that's a way to help them understand that there's, okay, if I could do that, what would it enable me to um, perform and produce? And how would it help me solve this problem? Um, yeah. So, so there's lots of ways, but it's, it's often what I find now is working with kind of micro development and micro learning around specific skills is more graspable for people. It's easier to put to work. It's easier for them to see that there's a difference there compared to when I gave the description I did at the beginning, basically talking about Keegan's, you know, the three levels in Keegan or not the self-transforming, but um, people can kind of nod their heads and recognize, but they wouldn't know what to do about it. And, and that's often the biggest challenge is how to operationalize developmental constructs and feedback. Um, and maybe that goes to the other question that uh, Margareta had about the difference between behavioral and developmental coaching. Um, and you know how much there is a difference or how much there isn't, I guess it depends a lot upon how a person constructs the meanings of those things. But I think often the ways I've heard it talked about is behavioral coaching is training people what to do and kind of implicitly expecting them to understand the way you formulate that to do compared to developmental coaching, which is more like Tessa has started to talk about in the chat here, is that coaching is development or um, a friend of mine, Mike Miscolo, wrote a book on psychotherapy as a developmental process. That when you're really in these uh, kinds of, how I say, helping relations broadly, either coaching or psychotherapy, these kind of things, what you're doing is inherently developmental. And the more you're kind of aware of that and aware of how to work with certain tools in a way like scaffolding, uh, directing people's attention, you know, using slightly more complex constructs to give them an opening to what could be different. 
all of those are things that are um, part of why coaching is inherently developmental. I see. Performing is e equals achiever in the old money. Oh, yeah. Bill changes his language on his thing every now and then. Suzanne changes her language. I, you know, I, there's so many different terminologies. Uh, Bill Joyner introduced a different language. Terry O'Fallon has a different language. Um, so you get used to these things. But I wanted to address um, Aileen had a question that she wrote in advance that was about discussing the whole thing of buy-in or lack thereof for participants on the leadership development journey, especially if, you know, as often happens, the organization sends them and says, go do this. And they think, oh, what did I do wrong? Why am I being punished? I got real work to do. Um, and how do you get buy-in? And I'm curious, and uh, now I gotta look to see, is Aileen here somewhere? Um, yeah. Yeah, there you are. Could, could you say a little bit more about that? Yeah, I think um, I was also just explaining it in the group, but just where um, you do have this prestigious program, a need has been identified for this adult development, which forms part of our leadership development program. And um, we've seen the impact, or we're seeing, we're in the process now, seeing the impact that this has made, but on those participants who haven't necessarily engaged or bought into the process and have literally done things to scrape through, you don't see those shifts. So obviously we're now recognizing that how do we then encourage that buy-in um, from the start or throughout? Yeah. No, that, that's, it's, it's a perennial question. Um, they bring some stories to mind. One program that we did for a large oil and gas company here in Norway, we used the Leadership Circle 360 and we used Immunity to Change at the start. And we had a three-day thing and we had one guy from Houston, a big kind of Hispanic guy and had a very reactive profile for, I don't know how many are familiar with the leadership circle, but it's basically kind of, there's creative on the top and reactive on the bottom. He was a very reactive and he says, I know how to fix my profile. I'll just fire them all. They just don't understand me. So he was sent and he was not bought in. Um, and what we had learned over time is because I've had this experience right from the get-go when I started teaching this at the university and so on, you get those who are engaged and enthused and they're kind of ripe to pop. And then you get a bunch who are just kind of looking around and eventually just kind of sitting back and disengaged. Mm -hmm. And part of what we learned is how to kind of create this heat environment mm -hmm. to make it real for them to, to, to really make it about them and their situation and not let them kind of squirm away from that. Mm -hmm. And we got better with practice, nothing more than practice at being able to uh, frame what we were doing in a way that made it easier for people to find hooks and connections. But, mm -hmm. but the work was immense. So we had one guy in the first cohort, I mean, my colleague was doing, it was six hours of coaching before he finally understood the third column in immunity to change and didn't just think his worry box, like what would happen if you did the opposite? Oh, it'd be wonderful. It took six hours to get him to finally realize that it was an oh shit moment. Um, so my, my main thing is it's practice at how do you frame and invite people into the container with kind of multiple entry points. Mm -hmm where they feel some personal pressure um, and, and feedback is a good way of doing that. Um, there are other ways to do it, but that's, yeah, you can't ensure it, but you can tend to have a higher percentage success ratio mm -hmm. by kind of broadening the entry, framing better and all the, for me, it just came with practice. So I remember in Scotland, in Aberdeen, one time we were doing this. And at the beginning, the internal person and I were talking and we said, at the end of tomorrow, you're going to feel like this. And they're looking at us. And, and then we got there and they said, how did you know? This is exactly how we feel now. 
but it took, this was about the 16th iteration of the program we've done. Mm -hmm. And that practice is so essential. And this goes to our own development. How do we learn in the complex domain and make mistakes and fail and see you know, what else could we try? What else could we add? How else could we do this? And just keep expanding that repertoire. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Can I just build on that question? It was just yeah. something occurring to me during what Claire was saying and, and what um, Aileen was asking. So I'm now on, I think, my fifth iteration of a proposal to a sales director who is a bit like the person that you've just described. <laughs> and to even get into discussion, there needs to be a document first. Yeah. And so we haven't got the opportunity to discuss and to talk about scenarios and how um, this kind of work might broaden it. So I was chatting to the HR people and they're saying, look, we get it completely, but this guy, he kicks anything out, anything that doesn't show a black straight line between yep. whatever you're doing and sales yep. and profitability. So, yep. and you've got one shot. So, you know, and it's a document and it's static. <laughs> I'm wondering, and I suppose I'm being a bit cheeky as well in, in this challenge that I'm having, what your thoughts are around how, how you land a message in a static document about a less concretely visible framework and the enormous value that it brings to a sales director that really is only interested in profitability and yeah. most of his people anyway are, are units of economic output rather than humans. And how many of us can identify with this challenge and scenario, right? You know, most, most of us. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so I'll tell, I love to tell stories. I'll tell a little story and then say something because there's two different things that occurred to me in relation to that. But the story is this, we were at uh, actually Ericsson in Stockholm and we were doing a workshop for a team. Some friends of mine, they used to work there and then they were consultants. And we were talking about leadership agility and we were using Bill Joyner's framework and we did exercise, it was experiential. These 15, 16 people were like, oh, that's great, we're, we're really. And then the leader of that group at the end, he's kind of summing up and thanking us for the day. And he, and he started from where we left off. And as he talked, you could just feel it kind of go down to where he said, and we've just got to be excellent. And that was his mantra. That's all he could carry away and contain. And what it leads me to that, you know, in response to this is I've become more selective about what clients I'm willing to put time and energy in engaging. And selling to those who don't get it, that's, that's a lot of work. Now, I have ideas about that too but it's really finding the early adopters, finding the people who recognize the language and want to do something different. So the big oil and gas thing we did came about because this guy came into the company. I think they, they had been using Cotter's model of the leadership pipeline and for six years had done all these programs with an external company. And he said, no, oh, this isn't gonna work. We're gonna stop that and do something new, but we don't know what. And we got in touch through a thesis student of mine and he said, well, would you be willing to help us kind of design the first module? And so we played around with some stuff and set up to do a pilot. But in the meantime, he had five major consultancies bidding on this piece of work because they're a 22,000 person organization and these were gonna be hundreds of leaders going through this. In the end, he said, I went with you guys, i.e. nobody's from, you know, we, we went, I wasn't, I didn't even have a consulting company at that point. I just had a, like a single sole proprietor thing. So we're gonna go with this because I know from other work I've done that the things that I can buy off the shelf from McKinsey or Boston Consulting or whatever are not gonna get me what I need. So I need to do something different and this is different. Um, now, in terms of how to sell to the people that just wanna see the straight arrow to the bottom line, this is speaking that linear language. This is not a systems thinker. So giving elaborate, rich descriptions of all the subtle things that this can do, don't go there, just don't. It's like a Trojan horse. You gotta build a straight linear line that if, you know, so, 
a line that I can just imagine pulling different things together. If you want to drive sales, you, you need to increase the performance of all these departments and teams. Everybody needs to pull together. Now, what will affect that the most? More effective leadership. Because there's lots of research that says that business performance is a third to a half kind of influenced directly by the effectiveness of leadership. How are you going to make your leadership more effective? Well, we have ways to do that, <laughs> period. <laughs> you don't tell them the ways. You don't tell them how you're going to assess or do anything. You just say, we can help your leadership be more effective, which will lead to your teams performing better and drive sales. Lovely. And my first page might be, you've just got to be excellent. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> thank um, you John. there was one more question and, and there's questions julia had asked too that i haven't even gotten to but there was one about if i use the enneagram in my work and uh not explicitly i i am familiar for a long time very curious about it as a a method um i read helen palmer's book uh, 20 some years ago and found that it was super engaging and interesting. And then I have a friend in Oslo who started the Enneagram Institute of Norway. And so I got into taking the Riso Hudson assessment and I've done various things in relation to that. But what's most interesting to me is I have a friend of mine that I met a long time ago in the Bay Area. And I just put a link to an article I had him write that we published in the journal I edit where he integrates the Enneagram with immunity to change. And he says, these are two rich communities talking about how to support development and change that don't really talk to each other. And so he was putting this out as a conversation starter, essentially, to help bring that together. And, and what I can say very simply is, when I was doing the immunity to change work in the classroom, and I did it all virtually last year, I used a table he has where he, and I gave people this very simple distinctions of the nine types. And I asked them, just self-identify, which one feels more like you? Or maybe there's a couple of them, you know? And then he had sentence stems for if then big assumption formulation. He says, if you tend to be, you know, a three, here's the type of formulations that are likely going to be relevant for you. And the students found this so helpful because it gave them something that kind of named the things that were more tacit for them, just the way things were. And it made it explicit in a way that related to them more specifically than just a broad thing of, well, what are the consequences? You know, if this thing you're worried about happens, what, what's the consequence? This gave them a much more specific and concrete way to relate that to their own personality type. And so, and whose question was that? No, 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 I gotta look at all my, that was Susan. <laughs> oh, I don't see Susan. Okay, well, oh no, there you are, Susan, ah, sorry. See, I was scanning the wrong direction. I'd be curious, do you have anything more um, around that? Well, I'm not sure I'm the right Susan for the question. The question that I had was around object relations and with the Enneagram. Oh. So I may be a different Susan. And no, that. no, it's the same Susan. Yeah, that's that okay. Susan. And then, yeah, if I'm working with object relations. So when you mean yeah. object relations, are you talking about kind of subject object the way Keegan talks about it? No, it's not the subject object okay. um, uh, question that I had moved. Where I was coming from with this was, you know, and, and you're stepping into this was, you know, what work you've done, you know, with the Enneagram and linking this to, you know, all these different model, models, the immunity, ITC, you know, all this, and specifically on the object relations, which gets into, and I'm just starting to learn about this and play about this, is that unconscious bias. It talks about object relations is, is from each type point that we have, mm -hmm. you know, we come in with whatever unconscious bias is because that's just how we're wired or whatever. Right. 
Yep. So yep. how does that influence, you know, this work? How does this influence yeah. Yeah. adult yeah. development yeah. and such? Because there's this whole other level of it's that unconscious and subconscious piece. Yeah. You know, I, I think for me that the easiest way to talk, or at least my bias around talking about it, is through a lot of this um, immunity to change thing. Because what I see there is we're helping people take something that is just the way things are to them, the way things have to be. It, they, they, it can't be, you know, and it's held in place by a whole, often a history of early trauma or imprinting or modeling or whatever. And to make that something they can look at instead of something that's the lens they look through. And the Enneagram, I think... Oh, Julia, you, you need to mute once in a while. Yes. <laughs> it's okay. Um, so I think the Enneagram offers a helpful way to, again, make that more granular to people and more specific, like these are the biases you're going to tend to have. So as a five, I, I tend to really engage the world in a certain way. And uh, one thing, for instance, is like if I'm in a social setting, I want to find one or two people I find interesting, then I don't care about the rest. I just want to go deep in. But that's my buy. And I think, well, yeah, why would you want to mingle and talk to everybody like some of my colleagues do? Um, and making that explicit and an object allows me to say, OK, is there a limitation to my natural tendency? Are there certain situations where that might be helpful to think, can I stretch myself into another modality? Um, I was going to make a link to something about, yeah, uh, let's see if I can copy the link. So not, this isn't an Enneagram, but in terms of using immunity to change and, um, how would I say the, this is related to the, using the leadership circle as a feedback mechanism to help people see what's their one big thing. What, what do they want as an improvement goal? Often they get much deeper improvement goals out of that feedback. And then we can often link some of their reactive tendencies to these big assumptions because they start to see, well, there's a pattern here. I've been showing up like this and these are, I know Bob Anderson related these to the Enneagram. It's more explicitly related to Karen Horney's notions of moving uh, towards, uh, moving away, protecting, kind of distancing, or, or having power over others. And those are kind of three main types within which there are probably multiple Enneagram types. Okay, Alistair. Yes, why not give them what they want? Can you say more about that, Alistair? Hi, um, thanks, Jonathan. Yeah, I'm one of those people, to be honest. I was an accountant up until April oh. and becoming a coach, it was sort of like a rebel movement for me to say, you know, you get an, an intervention, and nice slides, nice food, everybody feels great. But the, there is no transformation um, in the teams. Mm -hmm. So, um, I mean, today I was, I, was, I was with a potential client and he was talking about metrics. And, um, and I said to him, well, you need to tell me what your KPIs are. Mm -hmm. Or, I mean, I mean, it's, it's DNI work, so it's very easy to measure right. diversity, but measuring inclusion is a different ball game. So if I'm going to give you my money, how do I know that this fancy presentation you have is going to produce results? Yeah. You know, so, so I, I said to him, show, show me your KPIs. Then when you get your bonus, we know that you delivered on whatever it is. Right. So then, so then it goes back to um, the question around, how do I frame this? 
if you're confident of the tool you're selling, then you should be able to quantify to some degree of accuracy the effectiveness of what you're going to bring in. Sure. You know, that's kind of where my mind is, is coming from. Yeah. And, and, you know, this is a question that I know, and I remember when we had Richard Barrett, um, who has the Barrett Value Center, but when he was just forming that 20 some years ago, we had him come to where I lived in British Columbia. And he was talking about that, like, how do you build that chain to show that the KPIs, the performance will improve? Mm. And the, the thing, it's not like you can't build a logical chain, but what you know is that there are, how would you say, mediating factors. So we can say, you can do the best, you can become the best leader you can be, but if the government comes in with new regulations or the stock market tanks or this happens, you can't control that. So the, the bottom line performance has a number of variables that influence it. And what you can say is we can help improve the impact this variable will have on it. And you should be able to see results given that some other catastrophic things don't happen to upset that. Mm. And, and that's where the confidence comes because it's confidence with humility. It's understanding what you can assert and claim that you can deliver and being clear about what else is going on that you don't, you can't control for them. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it, it's the second part of this question is coaching in my understanding is meeting the client where they're at. Yes. Um, I'm one of those savings who doesn't want to dabble in their emotions. I don't, I don't want to. Right. So then the coach is trying to model me. Is they're not meeting me where I'm at. You, you see what I'm trying to say? So if, yeah, okay. If, so, if I want to boost my sales, then that's what I want. So you know? that's a great, great, uh, again, no story came to mind. So we have a software tech company that um, they make custom ringtones and, or they have a marketplace for custom ringtones and skins for your smartphone. They're the biggest company in the world around this. Mm. Um, and they're local here. And so they're programmers. They're all tech geeks. And we were doing some work for them around helping their team leaders run better retrospectives. So very technical. You know, they're on two-week sprint. You have a review. You have a retrospective. They were struggling with the retrospectives. And I had an um, intern assistant with me who was doing his master's thesis at the time and used them as a project. Mm. And in one of these group meetings and workshops, this one guy said, you got to understand, we don't use the F word here. We don't talk about feelings. <laughs> and that became the title of his thesis. We don't use the F word here because it epitomized exactly this. For many clients, that's a no-go. We, we don't have the training. If you go to engineering school or computer science or whatever, nobody's teaching you about reflection and feelings. So now what we helped them see was that, and this kind of loops back to something we talked about earlier, I think. We helped them see that even though they didn't talk about them, feelings were, they still had feelings. Mm -hmm. And those feelings were, influencing how they interacted with each other and if mm -hmm. we gave them some very small safe steps to take so in the retrospective um, one of the teams had a good thing that we adopted and said so just put on a sticky note you know around this issue do you feel positive or negative mm -hmm. that's simple enough yeah and then you could follow up and say so uh, what what is it that helped you feel positive you know, and, and or are there more feelings related to that? Or why did you feel negative about it? What, and then you can help them kind of make more distinctions around the feelings, but you lead them from something simple enough to something a little more complex. Now, it's not asking them to be systemic thinkers, mm -hmm. um, but anybody at any developmental level has feelings. It's just the skillfulness of being able to name them and the safety to be able to talk about it.
Okay, I'll do my homework on on feelings and adult development. <laughs> then I'll I understand think a bit more. It, it it is just like anything. There's a, a neuroscience book I read recently by Lisa Feldman Barrett on how emotions are made, and one of the things that a lot of research has shown is that we we all start out with this very kind of binary. Um, generalized sense of pain or pleasure, you know, things are good or things are bad. And we all kind of are rooted in that. But as we mature, we develop a more nuanced vocabulary. Oh, I feel hmm. happy. Oh, I feel ecstatic or elated or joyful. All of those give a little different tone that can help us be clear about things. Claire. Oh, thank you. I had a question and it kind of links to to also just a, a comment in relation to feelings. I do a lot of diversity and inclusion work and obviously feelings are very big in that regard. Yeah. And one of the things that we've started doing is actually what we call inoculations. So before we even start the work, we kind of lay out this, you know, they're very um, predictable patterns of, of feeling and behavior that will emerge. And, um, you know, so part of what we build into the, the kind of the, the, the training or the work is actually checking in on, on those feelings and, and how it is that they are shaping your interaction in the space. Um, and so even, you know, when it comes to, you know, angry resistance or sadness, for for kind of participants in the space to understand that that's it's good and normal and this is what should be and yeah. this is this is the nature of it yeah. um and just anyway if i can build on that for just a moment and, and it will link i think alistair to a little bit of what you were asking about too i think part of it is to help people just get in tune with their bodies mm. are you feeling tension you know, where are you feeling it? What is that tension about? What would help you relax it? So the somatic element of, because people will often be able to, again, it's a more sensory motor, it's a more concrete thing. It's easier to point to or talk about. Yeah, my heart's racing, I'm breathing hard. I feel stressed or I feel relaxed. Those are bodily sensations are easier to talk about and give feeling words to. Yeah. Um, and but related to that is is how how can how can we think about diversity and inclusion work um, using the idea of adult development? I mean, I've got a few ideas, but I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. <laughs> I'd like to hear yours. <laughs> I, I, so this is the thing. I live in Norway where it's a relatively homogenous, although diversifying society, where I did my doctoral work in the US, it was 98% white. But they had an incident with the law school with an African-American student and a, you know some hate letters and the FBI got involved. And suddenly they got big on doing something about diversity. and. A friend of mine was uh, the academic vice president for diversity, a tall Hopi Indian. And he understood for him that diversity wasn't about race. It was a much broader category of things. And there's many types of diversity, including developmental diversity. And so I got to teach uh, a very diverse, interesting group of students for a year around this. And I learned so much about the subtle micro ways in which interactions that I would be totally unconscious of had an impact for them. And I if I think about that, I think in any kind of developmental trajectory, you start out very basic. And just getting people to be able to tell stories about their experiences at a very basic level and getting people to listen and hear those starts them on a trajectory of opening up and enriching their understanding of what life looks like for others. Now, the developmental part of it 
you know, within that trajectory is maybe clear how people's own kind of meaning making plays into that, of course, is a thing you could be explicitly adding in and say, okay, now you've listened to this number of stories. You know, what meanings do you take away? What, what message does this give to you? And then you would see how people are making meaning. It's kind of like now you've done a meta level thing or a metacognitive thing. Ask them to get out of the specifics of the stories and say, is there a pattern? Is there meaning? Is there something I take? And that will give you clues about what can you do to then support, um, reinforce certain um, helpful meanings and back to Alistair's meet them where they're at. You know, what are the things that you want to anchor and make sure are healthy versions, even if they're relatively simple and linear, if they're healthy, that's important. So if you think of spiral dynamics work, it's not about being at a certain developmental stage is much more about having health in all levels of development. So how do you make sure that each kind of narrative and meaning around that is able to be held and framed by the group in a way that makes it normal, makes it okay, or says, hmm, yeah, that's something that's painful. That's something that's vulnerable. That's something that's whatever, and how do we want to be with that? And those kind of things I think will help people. But now, what are your ideas? You said you had some. Oh, yes, I mean, I think there's just a, there's, there's a correlation, but there's a relationship between the capacity to, to work meaningfully and usefully and, you know, transformatively with difference. Um, and, and, um, developmental stage. Um, I think that part of um, development is working with complexity and working, you know, that's, that is essentially what working with diversity is about. It's about um, understanding and being able to meaningfully engage with, with the complexity of humanity and, you know, enabling organizations to do that too. Um, so for me, there's a, a strong correlation between um, kind of cognitive and even spiritual development and the capacity to work meaningfully uh, with, with difference. So, um, yeah, that's how I would see it. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not sure. This is 20 some years ago, and I don't know. Let me just see if the, I, I thought there it is. Full documentary is on. So there's a documentary that was made in the US 20 some years ago. And I don't see the full thing on there, but probably one of these play all. Okay, oh, yeah, full playlist. So let's try this. I'll, I'll put the link in the chat here. Okay. It's called The Color of Fear. And it was this weekend retreat with an Asian American documentary maker, two other Asian Americans, two African Americans, two Latin Americans, and two white Americans. And they had a weekend dialogue. And wow, I mean, I remember the first time I watched with a small group, we just sat silent for 20 minutes. It was so impactful. And the transformation that it brought about, um, well, that's part two that I sent you. Anyway, if you, if you look it up, you'll, you'll find it there. Um, but what, if I think back to, and I haven't watched it for a long time, but part of development, and, and this maybe goes to something that I think is really important in all these models, which is it's very hard to grow up without cleaning up, without addressing our shadows, addressing our limiting beliefs and assumptions, our fears, all these things. And the way you're talking about this, it's like, yeah, that's all going to be in play. But if we don't take care of people's sense of safety or fears or traumas, then developmental work is only going to be how say, more complex justifications of BS. So I've got a whole model around that kind of yeah. stuff. You know, it, it's so important to 
Um, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the Arbinger Institute's work. Ah, Alistair, good. Leadership and self-deception is one of the texts that I use in all my classes and I have used their work for years, but this notion that the starting position, you know, is a heart at peace. And if you're in the box or have an inward mindset, all the developmental complexity in the world is going to do is give you more complex means to justify stupid stuff. And, and we have a, a good example of that here. So in Norway, 10 years ago this summer, we had the biggest kind of shock and tragedy in society. Um, this guy, Anders Breivik, you know, lit a bomb in Oslo at the government buildings. And then while the police were distracting diverted, went off to an island where there was a youth retreat of a political party and gunned down 77 kids. It was huge trauma here because it's a small enough country that you only had basically two degrees of separation from anybody knowing somebody who was there. And uh, a couple of colleagues that I know wrote a paper where they analyzed the complexity of this guy's thinking and his mentor's thinking, and it was actually quite complex. But what he was thinking complexly about was not good. Claire? Yeah, I actually just want to build on what you're saying. I mean, we see, in mean, my experience working with the leadership, I work in higher education, so it's a slightly different context, but working with with leadership who are really really well kind of developed in terms of their complexity and so in certain areas but when it comes to dealing with questions of diversity particularly gender race you know those big questions they are completely they're still toddlers and i mean i use that word yeah. <laughs> i use that word in jest but there's this there's so there, there's kind of real complexity in some aspects of, of their, I mean, their, their, who they are and their leadership, but com complete lack of complexity in others. And, well, and so- Well, and I think yeah. that that goes to the, the notion that those kind of programmings get injected very young and early. So they're very deeply programmed and the, the energetic and meaning making around them is at earlier developmental levels. And Ken Wilber talked about this a lot. He said, you can't address trauma at some late stage of complexity of reasoning. You need to address it at the level it was created. And I think that's a big problem in these kind of situations. People are carrying around an enculturation as infants who, um, somehow then, you know, it just becomes so subject or implicit that you don't even notice it. And then all the cognitive complexity is in service of getting hijacked by this early level programming. Oh, and Alistair has a good question here. Yes, I don't know. I don't know. Is, okay. Oh, Julia's back. I we had to, had to admit she's, her, but she's, I... she's in and out. Um, she's muted now. It's cool. I'm back. I'm back. I'm just in disguise as Lucille, <laughs> and I've been listening to the conversation, which has been absolutely brilliant. And I, I'm just your the wealth and breadth of your knowledge, Jonathan, is profound. Oh, thank you. It's, it's called gray hair and, and the grace of being able to, what I say, the people in this community have been so um, open about sharing their experience and knowledge, you know? I mean, Suzanne just let us stay at her place for a week. And you know, oh, here's the manual, and here's how I score these things and this kind of stuff. Yeah. Bill Torbert came and stayed here with us for a few days when we ran one of his certifications. Um, so, so I just feel very grateful for being able to hang out with a community of people who for a long time, and then you, you gradually absorb and put stuff together. 
there's a question Alistair asks here that my students ask a lot. What does adult learning say about being authentic and being true to yourself? I actually had a student write her master's thesis about this um, loosely because the question of authenticity, you know, what does it mean to be true to yourself? And what Sorry, does that mean? That, um, if I can put it into context, um, I recently got my Euphoria Enneagram report. So then you, there's improvement areas, right? So then part of me is like, I'm happy with the way that I am. My thinking is like, how do I improve being me? Not to work on the other areas. Then am I not betraying myself? Mm -hmm. And there was an Irish lady who was on this platform a few weeks ago. And we were talking about this stuff. Like, how do you, how do you, how do you become authentic? Do you now shut down that other part of you that is toxic so to speak or do you express it that's the struggle i'm going through uh, mm. it, that's it's such a good question and and it, it it's such a entangled thing when you try to relate it to adult development so for instance is being true to yourself saying everything you think i don't think so actually because Self-regulation, emotion regulation is such a profoundly important skill. Cognitive complexity is nothing without emotion regulation because our attention is driven by affect and emotion. And they are not two separate things at all, emotion and cognition. And all the neuroscience tells us this now, um, a lot of the developmental psychology tells us this. So the what I, what, I, what I want to get at is I can imagine if I think of myself, there's lots of things I think and lots of things I get triggered by that I could respond with and have that weren't helpful. And when I look back, aren't really me. So how do I discern between what's truly part of me and helpful? So I'm not just an isolated person. I exist in relationship. And if you're referencing, you know, that word mindset, what is the light of the being of others calling me and my humanity to do? That's being authentic. And that often means not just whatever um, things I picked up earlier in life that made me fearful of this or things about that, that I just accumulated a bunch of garbage how do I sort through that? And this is often a challenge because in Keegan's level, you know, a, a 10 year old is being authentic when they're egotistical because that is the way they make meaning of the world and to ask them to be self-authoring But it doesn't mean you can't help them to start to regulate and understand healthy boundaries around this. And those healthy boundaries start a developmental process where they take the other into consideration. Now, you can also say, and, and my students who are reading, I have them read this book, The Map, uh, Keith Eigel and Carl Kunert, a uh, wonderfully simple uh, description of basically Robert Keegan's developmental work. There are some limitations to parts of it and so on, but it's a very good introduction and the students often say, well, it, it looks like you're not authentic until you're level four, self-authoring. That, you know, when you're in the socialized mind and you're just acting on all the impulses that come in, how can you be authentic? And this gets us into trying to understand what is authenticity. And it is not an easy answer, you know, because all of these things play into it. So for me, I think the authenticity relates mostly to this outward mindset, heart at peace, you know, and learning to regulate the things that are just justification of self-betrayal. Mm. That's, it's very complex. Yep. It's a journey. It's a journey. I, I so Carl Rogers, you know, he's, one of the big figures in our counseling program. And there's this famous um, series where he and Fritz Perls and Albert Ellis all 
did a counseling session with the same woman. And I show a clip of this and Robert Keegan deconstructs this in his book, In Over Our Heads. And you see that Carl Rogers, even though he's client-centered, he interrupts her and he says, it's no damn good if you think I'm supporting you, you need to support yourself. And he reframes it and he's basically implicitly expecting her to have a self-authoring mind, to think for herself. And you can see that she's wavering between wanting to meet the expectations of others and wanting to do things for herself. And she's caught developmentally in between those. And what does authenticity look like in those moments? As a coach, how do you hold that for a person? So, what are you guys thinking? What do you want to ask next? I know there's questions that Julia has here, but I think we've touched on some of them. Yeah. I, I think um, I can put in a link to this too. This is the wait till it comes out in paperback. Um, it's way too expensive as an academic book. But this is an anthology with five different PhDs uh, condensed down into chapters. It has a whole range of different developmental models in relation to leadership. Um, somebody asked about, or maybe Julia, that, for instance, what happens when people regress? Under stress, we regress. And there's a whole PhD research done where a person used um, so she had Suzanne Cook Greuter's assessment done on a group of people and they were in a Tavistock type group dynamics workshop and he observed their behaviors when they got triggered and how they behaved and, and then interviewed them afterwards and has a very, you know, I mean, a PhD thesis around what happens developmentally to the types of ways they fall and regress, but the ways they recover from it how long they get hooked in it, what strategies they have, how they make use of those moments. So that's one of the chapters. There's a thing on a relationship to trust. I gotta think, what, what, it's been a while, you know, you do these and they come out, but it's all old news by then. Um, yeah, there's uh, implications of developmental diversity. That's, that's the one about um, fallback. There's one on trust, using adult development to accelerate trust. There's one on the complex choreography of becoming a coach. Uh, there's one from people from the Center for Creative Leadership, which talks about the art and science of vertical development. Um, one related to leadership member exchange theory. One, how do you support post-autonomous leadership development that comes from Pacific Integral. Um, there's somebody at Intel who did uh, a PhD on meaning making structures in leaders around conative capability. So not cognitive, but conative, which is more about will to action in these things. There's one on dialectical thinking. Um, yeah, so, and then I did a chapter with my colleagues and talk about, so I use lectical assessments, which are very much focused on this kind of cognitive complexity and can give this very fine grained nuances that are more actionable. And so I have a chapter on how we use that in a program in the city here, combined with immunity to change in the leadership circle. Um, yeah. I need to stop talking once in a while. Oh, and here's a link too, just in terms of the developmental model I use and the person I've learned the most about development from is Theo Dawson. And I was able to kind of get her on a panel and host this conversation for this mind shift event uh, that was, well, it's been a series of them. So this was the one in May. And so her and Peter Singe were talking for half an hour about all these kind of issues. The, the topic they were given was cognitive thinking skills, but they kind of reframed and grew that out. Julia wants to know about global trends. Um, you know, when I was 
starting doing leadership circle certifications, introducing adult development was new for most of the participants. The last ones I did, more than half the people were already familiar with this. So I get the feeling that at least among the coaching and consulting community, which in my experience tend to be people that have matured and outgrown organizational life to a degree and, and see the limits of it and want to support that from the outside to have more freedom and flexibility to do creative supportive things, that among that community, this kind of work is on the uptake. Uh, certainly the Growth Edge Network and Cultivating Leadership are, if you listen to, um, you know, Voss from Novartis, the CEO of Novartis in conversation with Jennifer um, Garvey Berger, talking about development and coaching and leadership. Uh, so these things are getting traction um, on a large scale. And, you know, companies like Novartis are using developmental thinking explicitly in a 100,000 person organization. Oh, and there was a sort of Roche, the pharmaceutical has been using the leadership circle and immunity and these things now on a massive scale now. And their uh, CHRO was public about this at a conference in London saying, the transformation and growth that we've had from using these tools and doing this developmental work has had enormous impact on our bottom line. So, so wow. there are early adopters in cases where this is starting to get out there and be more known and be more explicitly talked about. It's not that it's so common that everybody knows, but the whole mind shift, um, I don't know what you call it, movement. Uh, I'm trying to think of where my link is to that. Uh, well, so here's the thing. When we had Bob Keegan in Stockholm to talk about this, there was the major Swedish newspaper published an editorial on societal challenges require investments in adult development and did a series of interviews with people around this. And then let's see if I am uh, my, so this is now where this group um, that hosts these events. So, you know, they, they got all the, I don't want to say all the right names. You'll see on this link, Jennifer was there, Peter Otto Sharmer, Bob Keegan, um, there's a whole bunch of people speaking at these events now. And their, their mission is to make adult development part of public discourse in the way gender equity and sustainability are part of public discourse. So these things are happening and there are people who have resources. Their agenda is to get this in the UN at, by 2025 to get them to adopt it with the like the UN sustainability goals. This is the inner development goals that help us reach the sustainability goals. So this is the angle they're taking on making this more open and public. Ah, you're just smiling away there, Julia. It's making me very, very happy as we sit working on a developmental program at the moment. Um, it's just so deeply satisfying to see a table in the world all over you know, we work here at the bottom of Africa. Sometimes we forget that we're part of a global move. And I've just, I've just made something very happy hearing you somehow link us with those people. Yeah, and I think there is. It's a friend of mine who worked with Meg Wheatley a lot, uh, helped be, he was co-leader of the Burkana Institute for a long time. Um, he had this wonderful phrase that I use, like it's called the case of the isolated many. Uh, so there are actually many of us who are thinking like this and doing these things, but we don't know each other, don't connect to each other. And it's things like the mind shift thing where there are I think 1500 people online at this conference, hearing all about different angles and different tracks around how this kind of developmental thinking can help in organizations, in society at large, and all this kind of stuff. Um, so that people are getting linked up little by little, but it's it's a process, and it takes resources to host events like this, 
that can able, enable people to find each other. It's interesting also the examples you gave with corporate. We are finding in South Africa, and I'm not sure if it's a function of COVID, that we're getting a lot more traction in state-owned enterprises. And I'm not sure, um, you know, government agencies, I'm not sure if it's because they've got kind of desperate, or if they're the only ones that have money at this point, or, or what the story is. What have you seen around that in markets internationally? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I've got a friend of mine who's from South Africa, um, who's in Australia now, and is going to move to Ireland, it turns out. Um, but she had this uh, thing, she was helping McKinsey design things and using these ideas. And now she's got a, a global corporate client in the kind of financial services industry as a, a, a consulting firm there. And they had to go you know, and totally adapt what they're doing, but she's still able to help them. And she's got very creative ways of getting them to take these kind of almost Trojan horse-like micro steps that initiate them into thinking about development without having yeah. to get into a big framework or everything, but do things that help them grow in development. And for the few who are curious and want to know more, you can talk about theories and frameworks in a broader way. But for most of the leaders in the organization, it's just, we have ways to help you. They're, the fact that they're informed by developmental theory, they don't need to know or care about that. Yeah, yeah. Susan. Um. This is fascinating, Jonathan, on so many different levels. Thank you. Um, you'd mentioned something earlier, and I was just intrigued with it. And I don't know if there's anything out there around storytelling. So mm -hmm. it's like helping to grow people's insights, their awareness, wherever they're at. And I know individuals who are working on storytelling. That is their business, and you hear that it's big and yep. such. I'm just interested if you've got any resources or tools around that of um, – Oh, I'm watching a deer out my door. I'm sorry, um, my window. Um, anything around storytelling and helping yeah. with developmental awareness, that growth that may be useful. It's it's um it's a very complex thing. So I work with SenseMaker with Cognitive Edge and the Kinefin framework. Um, I know there's people in South Africa. Sonia Ligno, you know, is big in this. She's very big in this, doing it for a long time. Um, and what what I found there is working with people who can tell their stories, but then help them reflect on their story. So, so the, for those who aren't familiar, it's basically a tool that allows people to put in micro narratives or tell little stories about an incident, but then you give them prompts to help them interpret and make meaning out of. So it actually gives them value because it helps them understand their own experience and there's a kind of developmental lens to that and so we've been experimenting for instance with using that in a large course at the university here trying to get the students help to learn how to reflect so they write down an experience and then we give them some prompts and some triggers what well, was your experience more about this or this or this was it like that? and it gets them thinking about it so it's very simple ways to use storytelling to do that the the larger goal is to have an organization or a community then have the opportunity to look at a whole bunch of stories and say, well, why did these people think these ones were negative and happen very frequently? Or why were these positive and so seldom? And look at those stories and understand their own context and make more complex sense out of their own community or organization. And that's very developmental because you're helping people go from the kind of muddiness of complexity where less is known than unknown mm -hmm. to a little bit more being known. And there's a kind of developmental trajectory to that. It's not, I don't know if it's how it's related developmentally to this. I did one thing for the leadership circle on Kinefin and developmental complexity, but you can make loose associations between it. But I think broadly, the practical thing for people is when they're able to tell stories, reflect on them, and then 
share collective sense making around what do those tell us about our collective context, there is some kind of development I'm sure is happening there. Thank you. Alistair. Yeah. Um, quick one. Um, you spoke about, I think it's Novartis that had measurable increases in profitability. That was Roche. Rush, okay. Is there like an article around that? Because it, it then becomes easier to yeah, I know to sell to people who've got linear um, minds like mine. Yeah, um, I heard it was a talk at a conference, and okay. somebody who was there was saying that. So I don't have a direct link or reference to it right now. If I find it, I can certainly share it with uh, Julian, Simon, and so on to, to share with you. But um, I don't have something no, that's exactly right, like yeah. that at hand, yeah. Okay. But you. yeah, it's exactly those kind of things we're all dying for, where somebody says, we did this. The article I put in earlier, um, that's an open source article from a coaching journal at Oxford. Um, that was one of the early things. The one that says IJEMBCB, which is the International Journal of evidence-based coaching and mentoring at Brooks College at, you know, at Oxford. That one talks about the impact that doing this kind of developmental coaching work had on, at this point, it was about 300 leaders in an organization. It doesn't go all the way to bottom line results and performance, but it talks about what were they able to do differently as a result of this kind of work? What were the trends or patterns we saw in how they made meaning related to their own leadership and so on. Cool. Thank you. I think we're at three minutes too. Yeah. Oof. Wow. Any final burning questions for Jonathan before we lose this enormous and beautiful brain? that we've had only yeah. two hours. I hope I don't lose yes. that. <laughs> no, no, no we, we want you back. We want you back for more questions, John. I've, I've really enjoyed listening, and I think it's been incredibly helpful that I haven't been able to respond because I would have been even more annoying than I was already. <laughs> so this so is a I good think, thing. <laughs> that's a good thing to have me on bad Wi-Fi. But I'd love to be back another time and all and all continue the conversation with you about swapping students or connecting people. So and what would be so very much. what would be helpful for me is you guys mentioned you guys have your own kind of assessment suite and put you know if I had a yeah. first hand experience of that and you told me more about how yeah. you're working with it and stuff, then I could kind of drill in more specifically. Absolutely. Yeah. Simon. Andrea's on it. Okay. Nope, Andrea, Andrea's on. making a note. You'll have an assessment right. link imminently. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. That's been incredible. Um, your extraordinary storytelling, what I'm taking away. And I'm like having this um, wonderment about the size of the computer to your right that you keep looking at. Because oh, it it's just enormous. No. Like, no, it's just I have a, a monitor like this. So you yes. guys are here, and then I have the browser open, you know, so I can jump to that article and this page and the color of here and the money, right? So this is yeah. just, yeah. That must be a repository of enormous proportions. <laughs> oh, I don't know. <laughs> well, it, it's one of these things that you accumulate a lot of stuff, and eventually that forces you to have to synthesize it and be able to contextualize it. Mm. And I think that's what I've seen has been useful for others that, that I've had to go through that process and I can do those kind of things very easily. Yeah, which is actually indicative of the developmental process itself that you've been talking about for the last two hours. Synthesize and then, and then give it back in such a, a beautifully um, straightforward way. It's amazing, it's an amazing gift. Well, sometimes it's not always straightforward. You can see I can take long detours too. Just wait. I mean, if I really tried to give a lecture on some of this stuff, then you guys would really be in trouble. <laughs> well, please invite us and we'll make up our own <laughs> minds about that. It's been amazing. Thank you.
but but I just want to say I really appreciate the engagement and the quality of questions and reflections and stuff. Uh, and I wish I could have heard from more more people. Um, but that's what's fun for me is being able to kind of try to tap into your world and context and, and build some bridges and connect things. So that's always fun. Thank you. Thanks so much. Um, I just want to take just say one thing before everybody goes. There is a course on trauma that Ingrid Herwitz is running. It is a six times three hour course, which promises to be extraordinary. If you haven't signed up, then the flyers are coming out. Have a look at that. Um, it's well worth looking at uh, starting in September, I believe. September, October. Jonathan, thank you again. Thanks to everyone for beaming in from wherever you were. Thank you. And, um, Julia will be back in the hot seat next week and yeah. out of the bus seat. So out of the bus seat, yeah. <laughs> it looks like you're riding a horse so much. You're kind of bouncing like little by it's, little. It's the Eastern Cape. The roads are not good. No, just arrived. The space background. The space background. It's like an intergalactic horse. Oh, yes. <laughs> Thank okay, you, everybody. Now, this group needs a lecture, so I need to go. Goodbye. Go. Still needs to talk to Bye. Thank Take you. Me. Thanks, Jonathan. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thanks, Jonathan. Thanks so much, Jonathan. Yeah. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.